Alright, it's good to see everybody here this evening. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 37. How great thou art. These are the little words of what we sing in our course book. Nonetheless, good words. 37. Chapter of condemnation. Well, imagine this being a trial. 
And uh, these are charges, these are indictments that God is bringing against this people Israel. And uh, with reason, he's a just God. And it's just like in modern day trials, you have the prosecution that stands up first and presents its case. And then you have the defense then that stands up to present its case in defense. Well, here's the prosecution. This is God himself. But guess what? By the time he's done, there's no defense. In fact, we're going to see this here with regard to what the Lord says to Jeremiah in verse 1. And we'll read from verse 1 down to verse 14 for this reading. And it begins, Then said the Lord unto me, this is God's word, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, here he's telling Jeremiah, don't even think about bringing defense. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me to present some sort of defense against my dealings with this people, yet my mind could not be toward this people. So much for those that preach that somehow God loves everybody and has a wonderful plan for their life. He says, cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. That's his judgment. So there will be no argument to persuade God in any other way. Now when he cites Moses and Samuel, and in essence is saying to Jeremiah not to pray for the people, because God had already determined their fate of judgment and exile. Moses and Samuel, back and read in their history there were times where they prayed they interceded and God did hear their prayer Moses seemed to as God purposed to destroy Israel and Moses pled with them back there in Exodus 32 that God determined not to destroy the people and Samuel same thing when he prayed the people were rescued what from what seemed to be certain destruction. But here, the Lord lets them know that the judgment has been determined. I have people that ask me from time to time, well, how is it that you know whether or not to continue to pray for certain people? Well, it's the Lord that gives the prayer, but it's the Lord who takes it away. And you and I know of different acquaintances perhaps that the Lord just has not given that prayer. True prayer is being directed by the Spirit of God. So here in verses 2 through 4 then of this particular scripture, it shall come to pass, if they say unto me, Whither shall we go forth? Thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, such as are to death, such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to tear, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. So here we see the Lord appointing four different types of destruction. I hear people say all the time, well, God chooses for salvation, but he doesn't ordain to condemnation. You haven't read the scriptures then. Where should we go? That's the question that's asked there in verse 2. God had promised in the previous verse that Judah would be cast out of his sight and would be sent forth. And so here, it's as if the question is anticipated. Where should we go? And the Lord declares death, sword, famine, captivity, some would go to death through a plague, 
That's what that seems to imply there. Pestilence. Is the Lord in plagues? Is he in viruses? Absolutely. Some will die in battle. That's what he means by the sword. Some would perish through famine. Now remember, because this Babylonian captivity just didn't happen at one time. It happened on three different occasions where Nebuchadnezzar came down and took people out. And he says the remaining, if any would remain alive, they'll go into captivity. There is no good way to die. Is what the Lord was declaring here. And then you see also concerning the dead, he mentions four forms of destruction. There would be ways in which those corpses would be dishonored after death. As if the death in of itself is not enough of a judgment. Here the Lord is saying that it would come through the sword, but then he says there through dogs. Verse 3. So that means the sword slain, but then what? The bodies wouldn't even be buried. The dogs would come and devour those corpses and the fowls of the heaven. This is talking about carnivorous birds that would come and feed upon the bodies. And then if there remained anything else, the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. For the Jewish people, there's nothing more dishonorable than not having a proper burial for dead people. Even today, it's their custom if someone dies to make sure they have a proper burial by sundown. That's how quickly they do it. They don't waste a lot of time. They want it to be a proper burial. But here, the Lord is saying that when slain, these corpses would undergo even further humiliation. It's as if the Lord is saying, don't weep for him, because he's purposed this desecration. And why? It goes back to what we studied when we were in 2 Kings chapter 21. It speaks there of Manasseh. He was the son of Hezekiah. Remember, Hezekiah was one of the Lord's servants kings that he raised up to bring about reform and put away idolatry in the land. In fact, one of the things that the children of Israel at that time were worshiping was the brazen serpent of all things, and Hezekiah destroyed it. And then his son came into power, and he wondered, well, why does the Lord mention specifically Manasseh here when all these other evil kings reigned even before Hezekiah. Well, the presumption is that the son would have seen his father's heart toward God and desire to rid the nation of Israel of its idolatry, and the Lord used him strongly in that way. But when he, Manasseh, became king, he reversed everything and went right back to what his father had destroyed. Is there a time where God will no longer show his forbearance toward a people, and toward a nation? Absolutely. That's what we find here. The Lord himself drawing the line. Referring to what took place with Manasseh for that which he did in Jerusalem. Now remember when we studied that, interestingly, as monstrous as Manasseh was, yet in the end, in 2 Chronicles 33, we read that Manasseh found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord forgave him, and yet did not undo what his legacy was, and required then those crimes that's described as crimes against the innocent and then the sins that he taught his people to embrace for that the Lord would bring them into judgment and he, he describes what it is there in verse 4 I will cause them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth it's interesting I did a little study because from this time forward, 
the Babylonian captivity, even though the Lord has, after the captivity, brought people back into Israel and uh, throughout all the different nations that were raised up, yet from this time forward, Israel has remained a dispersed people. Even in Christ's day, they were dispersed. Peter describes them as those that were pilgrims and strangers dispersed into all these countries. I looked it up. The last census is of 2020 has about 9 million people, 9,227 that actually live in Israel. That's the total population of the nation, the country of Israel. And of those, only 6,829,000 are Jews. So that means that only 74% of the population of Israel itself can claim any kind of Jewish roots. So even from this particular captivity in Assyria, God has, has mingled this people, dispersed them. In the total population of the world, they judge to be about 14 million total Jews. That's only 0.2%. Of a population of like 7.89 billion total. And yet the Lord has always preserved that nation. But when he says here, I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth, that wasn't just for a time. He purposed that they should be scattered. And here specifically, he pronounces this judgment on them as a whole, as a nation, but then there's always a remnant, mercy on a remnant. When he says, for who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem, or who shall bemoan thee, or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? I'll tell you what, if God ever gives up a, a nation or a people, there's nobody that's gonna stand before God to even ask on their behalf. He says in verse 6, Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. Thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. Now this is human language. We know that God is not a God that repents. Here the word perhaps might be better translated relenting or forbearing. But here God was withholding his hand and these thinking that because the destruction had not immediately taken place that now they were okay. But the Lord uses this human language, I am weary with relenting. There's a time when God's forbearance is no more. He doesn't change his mind with regard to his judgment. Those that he's determined to judge will be judged, but that time is by God's determination. And he says in verse 7, and I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. That's not our modern day fan. The word there literally is the winnowing. I was growing up in Africa, I worked over there, I saw when the women would bring the rice back to the field and pound it, they had these little winnowers that were made out of woven and, and they would literally take and face the wind and throw that rice up in the air and the chaff would blow away. This is the picture here of God that would scatter Judah as if it were a winnowing fan. But he also says here in verse 8, their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. God determines who lives and dies. In this particular instance, he's speaking of removing the heads of the families, the fathers and uh, the husbands, so that the widows are preserved, even though the husbands and fathers are carried away. He said, I have brought upon them against the mother of the young man a spoiler at noonday, which I have caused them to fall upon it suddenly and tears upon the city. Here we find the, the widow, in verse 9, she that hath borne seven languisheth. Normally, 
having seven children is considered to be a blessing. In fact, it's not a great blessing that God would so bless a woman. And yet, it says here, she had given up the ghost. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She had been ashamed and confounded, and the residue of that will I deliver to the sword before their enemies, saith the Lord. To have seven children, seven sons, would be a picture of complete happiness, but not in this case. So when Jeremiah reads all this in verse 10, or sees it, he says, woe is me. Takes all this on himself. My mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife, a man of contention to the whole world. Here's where you find Jeremiah as a type of Christ, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. That's a picture of Christ and his perfection as he walked on this earth. Men found reason to curse him, and yet he had done nothing for which they had any reason to curse him. It speaks of Christ and Scripture as being hated without cause. And Jeremiah is a type here, and this is his complaint. The Lord said, Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. There's the in the midst of judgment, his mercy. That even though God had purposed to destroy the majority and condemn them, yet he speaks here of a remnant. Verily it shall be well with thy remnant. Not only that people that God would preserve through Jeremiah's preaching and prophesying, but even himself being preserved, because he says, Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. This was God's answer to Jeremiah's plight. And this was literally fulfilled when they sought to kill Jeremiah and threw him in a dungeon, as we're going to read on later on in this, this book. But at one point, Nebuchadnezzar, that's when it says there, I will cause the, the enemy to entreat thee. Here's the, here's the enemy that God has brought against Israel, and yet he would cause Nebuchadnezzar to be kind to Jeremiah when he gave Nebuchadnezzar, his commander-in-chief, the order, and that's over in Jeremiah 39, 11, to look after Jeremiah and to do him no harm grant him all the privileges he was pleased to ask. I see a type and picture of Christ too, where even though all of these were against him, yet they could not do one thing more or less than what God had purposed. Even when Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? He said, you'd have no power at all for what it was given of my father. And so the question is asked here in verse 12, shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? So when something about the northern iron, that was the place up in Babylon, because Babylon was north of Israel. And the weapons of Babylon being iron and bronze up in that particular part of the country of Babylon, the what they call the northern ore back in the 7th, 7th century before Christ from the Black Sea region, actually is where people would go to get some of the finest iron ore and bronze. And he says, shall iron break the northern iron and the steel? Can man, could there be any weapon that could be made to stand against what God had purposed should come about from Babylon? He said, thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the spoil without price, and that for all thy sins, even all thy borders, purpose to take everything that was considered to be treasures, even in the house of the Lord. See, they blasphemed the house of the Lord. They perverted it, so the Lord took all those treasures and removed them. Babylon didn't have to pay anything for them. Took them into Babylon, where they were preserved and later brought back. 
But he said, I will make thee to pass with thine enemies into a land which thou knowest not. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, which shall burn upon you. This is a God that the world doesn't know. All of all you hear about today, oh, how God is love. God is love, but he loves his son. He loves his righteousness. And he loves those that he's purposed to save us. And other than that, the scriptures say the wrath of God abides upon the sinner. We'll pause there. And next time, take a look at Jeremiah's prayer. From verse 15 down to verse 21. Let's look to the Lord ourselves. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would truly cause our hearts to pause before you and consider that if you've been merciful to such sinners as we are, it's only because of your grace toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you have not destined such as we are to wrath and condemnation, although that is our just desert. But that the Lord Jesus Christ himself bore it. And by his death, such as we are, that you purposed our justified, declared righteous before you. Holy God, you are and uh, one to be glorified. I pray that you would keep our eyes fixed upon your son and his cross in all things. Give you the praise, honor, and glory. Our dear Savior's name, amen. Well, let's take our hymn book before the message of the hour and sing hymn number 294, Savior like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. 294. Savior, like a shepherd lead us, much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us, for our use thy fold prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast bought us, Thine we are. We are Thine, do Thou befriend us, Be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us sing Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, with Thy love our bosoms fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us still. Amen. May that be so. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 11. We begin our study or continue our study here in what God was revealing 
unto Daniel through his messenger and presumably even Gabriel, the one that the Lord sent to speak to Daniel about the unfolding of history. And that's really the title of this particular study here, the unfolding of history. And my text is going to be from Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 20. And had we the time, we would keep going. But this is going to be a history lesson. A lot of people, when they read Daniel, they're thinking in terms of prophetic, yet future. But as you get down and study, as we've seen to this point, all of what we're reading here, and particularly this chapter, chapter 11, contains one of the most specific, fulfilled prophecies of the Bible that you could ever find. It covers a period of some 375 years. Not quite the 490 that we saw, but it's, it's bringing us, as we study the unfolding of this history, up to that time just before the first century. And uh, it is so accurate in how it describes the unfolding of history at this point, looking back, that there are many naysayers that say, because they don't believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, they say, well, it must have been written post-history that this is not Daniel writing this, but it's somebody that went back and looked at it afterward and wrote it. But for me, when I read this, I see so plainly and clearly how this word is none other than God's word. Because he is the God of history. We talk about the unfolding of history. I like to put H-I-S in capital. It's the unfolding of his story. That's whose it is. God's a God of history, a God of providence. And all things exist because of him. And we don't have any clearer example of that than here. So in verse 1, it's a continuation. Remember, there were no chapter divisions. It's just a continuation that we saw in chapter 10. Also, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Remember we saw last time how these angels, it's a spiritual warfare. And this is an amazing thing when you consider here the Lord had sent his messenger, his angel, to strengthen Darius the Mede. Because this was a ruthless brutal ruler that had just taken over Babylon. You don't take out Babylon and, and do it in a peaceable way. And yet, even here, being an unconverted king, we find that the Lord was at work to confirm and strengthen him how to do exactly what God had already determined should be done through him. Even as we saw with Pilate, he could not do one thing more or less than what God had determined even with his wife begging him. It's a result of a dream not to crucify Christ, yet it had already been foretold that he would be delivered into his hand and crucified and slain him. And so here in verse 2, if you want to make notes in the margin as we go down through here, you'll see how this is history. Because it says, and now will I show thee the truth. History is taught from Scripture is the truth. How it pertains to what God purpose should be done, really in the preservation of that people Israel. And you might ask yourself, well, why preserve that people? Well, it's because God had already determined to bring his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about 500 some years before Christ came in the world. And yet God is directing history here, even through these different kings that would arise and fall. He said, Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. So none of this is 
just generally spoken. When it says three kings, we should be able to go back into history and read about three kings in Persia. And then the fourth, it says, shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Remember the vision that the Lord gave to Daniel that after Babylon would be raised up the Medes and the Persians, and after the Medes and the Persians would be Greece, or Alexander the Great. And so in fulfillment here, there were actually four kings from the time Daniel spoke going all the way to Xerxes. These were kings of Persia. And the one who did stir up all against the realm of Greece was Xerxes. When you study in history. Here, specifically, the angel did not mention Cyrus because it's, it's three kings moving forward from Cyrus. Looking to the future. And some would say, well, there was another king, Smyrtus of Persia, that was raised up around 522 before Christ, but he ruled less than one year and was actually an imposter to the throne, so he wasn't actually considered a king. So I find it interesting when you do that detail, the scriptures are correct. So from Persia to Greece here, these visions and insights that the Lord has given were relevant because in every one of these specific kings, there would be an attempt to wipe out the Jewish people at some point. Probably the one we know the most about during this period would have been during the reign of Xerxes, which you read about in the book of Esther. Remember the plot of Haman? So there was this attempt by all of these to wipe out the Jewish people. You know, in one sense, that continues today. When you look at that little sliver of land called Israel over there and all the enemies around that would seek to have that nation destroyed, and yet God has never permitted it. You say, why? That's because when he made that promise to Abraham, it wasn't conditioned upon their faithfulness. He said, as long as the moon shines and the sun rises, he would be preserve that nation. And I believe it'll be that way till the end. Now, there's nothing further as far as prophecy is concerned in Scripture that needs to be fulfilled. You've got people out there that are thinking there's all this stuff. Israel has to still has to happen. No. When Christ came and he cried, it is finished, it was finished. And as we saw in Daniel's vision of the 70 times seven, that the desolation, the abomination that was brought upon that people that was determined was when God gave them up and said that no more would they be his people. Paul spoke of the wrath of God coming upon them to the uttermost. They still exist. You still see Israel over there. You see those people over there, but I'll tell you, if you went to preach Christ to them, they, but for maybe some elect ones that are still among them, but as a nation as a whole, they're God haters. And so that's what we're reading here is how the Lord purposed to preserve this people, this nation, in spite of these kings that would arise and would seek their destruction. So we read on in verses three and four that a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Here we see a blending of what God's will is and yet them doing what they determined to do. That's what they did when they crucified our Lord. They delivered him up because they willed it and yet they did it because God willed it. And here it says when he shall stand up his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. 
and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides thee. See, men just presume that they rule by their power. But here we're seeing very clearly that none rule or none reign, but those that God has appointed and God has ordained. Now, when it says here that a mighty king shall stand up, remember, it's linked to verse 2, that all of these others would rise up and, and fall up until the time of Grecia. Well, who was the mighty king of Greece? That was Alexander the Great. And I believe here in verse 3, if you want to write that in the margin there, this has to do with Alexander the Great, who certainly was a mighty king. And yet where it says there, that, and where it says he stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to it, and well he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. Alexander the Great, in spite of all of his exploits that he did, Yet he died at 32 years of age. And history records that he died of a fever after a drunken party in Babylon. But when it says here, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. That's a judgment executed. God used him for a time to bring down the Persian kings that are mentioned in verse 2. And then when God had fulfilled all that he purposed to do with Alexander the Great, then God took him out. That's the sense of the word broken there. And you can read about this even in Josephus. I've mentioned reading Josephus, but I again need to warn you that it's not an easy reader. In fact, Josephus' book on the antiquities of the Jews contains actually 20 books and nine volumes. Now you can order it in three volumes, but it's small print. But it covers a period of history. Josephus was a historian that lived in the time of first century, but he wanted to write a history that was the history of the Jews from creation all the way until his time. And when you read it, it's amazing the comparison with the scriptures. And yet he wasn't a believer. But he speaks of this time where even Alexander the Great had intentions at one point to pillage Jerusalem. And yet, he speaks there of, and this is interesting, this is lit, lit, something extra biblical, and yet in history, that when Alexander the Great showed up in Jerusalem, one of the priests actually read the book of Daniel, showed him the book of Daniel, this prophecy, these prophecies that we're reading. And uh, he was so impressed with these priests and their defense of Jerusalem, because remember at this point, Jerusalem would have been rebuilt after Cyrus, that he actually gave leniency to the people of Jerusalem and to the temple and would not touch the temple at this specific time. So even with all of his greatness, the Lord kept him from doing anything that was not already ordained. That would be for later. But that temple would be destroyed when Titus would be raised up in the first century. But when it says here specifically that when he died, he was broken, cut off suddenly, that his kingdom would be divided, it says toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity. Here again, it's interesting if you go back and study it, and if you want to be a student of history, you can verify all this for yourself, that after Alexander's death, none of his descendants succeeded him, no matter how great he was. That's what the scripture said. It shall be divided toward the four winds, but not to his posterity. 
nor according to his dominion which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. We know that when Alexander died, there were three possible heirs. He had a half-brother, that half-brother's name was Philip, but he was mentally disabled, <laughs> mentally deficient. We've known some leaders that way. But also, he had a son that was born after he died. He was at a young age when Alexander died, and yet that son was newly born. So he could in no way take over where Alexander had left off. And then he had one other illegitimate son, son actually named Hercules. I don't know whether that's where we get the Hercules that we tend to know about in Greek mythology. But with all of this, since there wasn't any particular heir to take over, that's why it says here that it would be divided toward the four winds of heaven. So it went to different regents or appointed princes that served Alexander's cause. These were generals. And you could read about this too, four generals that after he died controlled the Greek empire for a while. But it wasn't according to Alexander's dominion. You see that in verse four, or according to his dominion. When you take a kingdom and split it up that way, then each one of those generals is gonna do what they wanna do. And so the rest of this prophecy really that we're studying here in this chapter focuses on two of those four, if you can just keep that in your mind, from Alexander's realm and the dynasties that they established. And only two are focused on here in our particular chapter because these two specifically and persistently fought against the promised land. Their desire was to take that land and dominate it. But here again, we see God in his providence preserving Israel, even through all of this. And you can see why Daniel was so concerned and perturbed as he studied, studied and understood these things and was bowed before the Lord. Because his heart was for that people. He was one of them at this particular time in captivity. But this was all future. This was all what was to unfold in history. Now, here specifically in verse 5, two of these princes, one's described as the king of the south, that shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion, his Dominion shall be a great dominion. So here it mentions the king of the south, first of all, that would become strong. So one of these four inheritors of the empire of Alexander the Great would become stronger and greater than all the others. And he would gain power over him and have dominion. If you study in history, you may have heard of an Egyptian or a Greek, it should be a Greek regent of that Greek empire in Egypt called Ptolemy, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, the first. So if you want to write that next to verse five, that's who it's talking about there. He exerted his control over the promised land. And soon after, the division of Alexander's empire, the Ptolemies, dominated in this region. If you want to Google it, look it up, you get a lot more detail. And Ptolemy the first had a prince named Seleucus, or Seleucus, S-E-L-E-U-C-U-S, -E -E that rose to power and took dominion over the region of Syria. 
So that's why it's mentioned here that there's a king of the south. But as you read on up in verse 6, and in the end of the years they shall join themselves together, there's a king of the north. And that would be the Seleucids that dominated up in Syria. So you've got some, one of his regions up there in Syria, the other down in Egypt. And what's in between? What's in between is Israel. And both of these fought to be the stronger in order to hold dominion over that land of Israel. And it says there in verse 6, in the end of the years, they shall join themselves together. They thought, well, here we are, two generals of the same empire, the Greek empire. Why is it that we should fight each other? And so they sought to do so through a marriage. That's often, as you study in history, what takes place. And here it says, For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. That's talking about a marriage. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Here the Lord is saying even before it took place that this alliance would fall apart. They sought to join forces. The daughter of the king of the south would go to the king of the north to make this agreement. You can study this again in history and, and find that this was fulfilled in the marriage between Antiochus II. Remember, we're getting to Antiochus Epiphanes, but he was of these Seleucids of the north and was one of the sons of the Seleucids. And this marriage took place between Antiochus II and Bernice. Bernice was the daughter of Ptolemy II down there in Egypt. All this is historical. And there was peace for a time because of this marriage, but it all fell apart when Ptolemy II died. It's interesting, these kings are put up for a while, but when they die, then just like with Alexander the Great, things fall apart. And that's why it says there, she shall not retain the power of the arm. Why? Because when he died, then she was no longer queen. And once Ptolemy II died, Antiochus II put her away and actually took back his former wife, whose name was Laodice, L-A-O-D-I-C-E. I'm just I'm giving you these details because everything we're reading here has been recorded as fulfilled according to God's purpose. And so neither he nor his authority would stand. History records that Laodice didn't trust her husband, Antiochus II, and so she poisoned him. That's how he died. It was certain that he was not going to rule or reign any longer than what God had determined. And she shall be given up with those who brought her. That's what it says there in verse 6. After the murder of Antiochus II, Laodice had Bernice her infant son and her attendants killed. So she killed Bernice, she killed Bernice's son and all of her attendants. None of this is far-fetched if you've ever looked at some of the history of kings and kingdoms, ruthlessness. And so after this reign of terror, Laodice actually set her son, who would have been Seleucus II, these are the Seleucids, put him on the throne of that Syrian dominion, the northern king that's mentioned here in our portion of scripture. So there's, there, here's where the battle begins again. It was a, a short-lived truce, verses 7 through 9. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come up, come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. This is the Lord determining who wins and who loses. 
and shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods with their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Even there, God determines the, the length of each reign. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his homeland. Here it says that he will come with an army there in verse 7. And here the angel told Daniel that a branch of her roots would come from the south and prevail over the kings of the north. Remember, Bernice's roots were down there in Egypt. She had just been married to the king of the north, but her roots were down there. This was fulfilled actually in the person of Ptolemy the third, because Ptolemy the second had died. He was the brother of Berenice. So that's where it says there in verse 7, out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. And uh, Ptolemy the third to avenge the murder of his sister, who had been killed by Leotis up there in the, the north, to avenge her murder, he invaded Syria and defeated Seleucus II. Well, these are the kingdoms, as, as we go down through, you remember the Seleucids. It's going to lead into the Antiochus as we go on, and then the, the Ptolemies down in Egypt. And it said he would continue more, more years than the king of the north. Actually, Ptolemy his history records lived actually four years past Seleucus II. But even that is a fulfillment of this prophecy. Verse 10, the sons of the king of the north and their victory, first they were defeated, but his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. For a while, it was Egypt, now it's Syria. Here, when it says his sons shall stir up strife, that would be the sons of the kings of the north that would come and continue the battle. And one of the sons, when it talks about here in verse 10, shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Well, what was in the middle between the north and the south? It was the land of Israel. And one of those sons would conquer, overwhelm, and pass through the land of Israel that stood as a buffer between the north and the south. Here it describes him assembling a multitude of great forces. Again in history, Seleucus III and Antiochus III, these were two sons of Seleucus II, but both were successful generals. And Seleucus III ruled only for a short time when he was succeeded by his brother. And in a furious battle, Antiochus III took back the land of Israel from the dominion of the Ptolemies. We think today how people still fighting over that land. Well, this has been going on for ages as God has purposed. But here in verses 11 and 12, it says the king of the south would again gain the upper hand over the king of the north, back and forth. The king of the south shall be moved with choler, anger, and shall come forth and fight with him, even the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. Here again, who determines the end from the beginning? It's the Lord. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. So here the, the king of the south would be moved with rage. Again, this is the angel telling Daniel that the king of the south would attack and meet a great multitude of soldiers from the king of the north. That's what it's talking about there shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude, that is the king of the north. But with all that the king of the north would bring against the king of the south, God had already purposed 
that the king of the south would win, regardless of the number, and the king of the north would be defeated. The king of the north would not prevail. So this was fulfilled when Antiochus III, and I'm mentioning these because it's going to be important when we get to Antiochus Epiphanes. That little horn, remember we studied about already? Antiochus III, this would have been his ancestors, was defeated at the Battle of Raphia, R-A-P-H-I-A. So these are real battles. And because of that loss, he was forced to give back dominion of the land of Israel to Ptolemy IV. These were names of, of kings, Ptolemy, Seleucids. And we read there in verse 13, the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fail. Isn't that interesting? To establish the vision. In other words, to, to confirm exactly what was being foretold here. And so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will and none shall stand before him and he shall stand in the glorious land. That means that he would conquer and take that land of Israel, which by his hand shall be consumed. And so, here the king of the north would come at the end of the years with a great army. And here the angel again is telling Daniel that that northern dynasty would fight back and defeat the king of the south in an extended siege when it talks about in verse 15, casting up a mount. And taking most of the fenced cities, the victory would be given to the king of the north, who would then have dominion over what's called the glorious land. That word glorious, actually, one of the marginal readings says that the land of ornaments, it was originally that in the sense that it was a land of milk and honey. In fact, if you look over in Ezekiel chapter 20, real quickly, that's how the land is referred to. And speaking of the land of Israel, the glory is glorious in that that's where God purposed that his glory should dwell for a time. Dwell in that temple and uh, that in the fullness of time, the true glory should come and enter that temple, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's the language used over here in Exodus chapter 20 and other verses we could look at. Notice how it's put, in the day that I lifted up mine hand, verse 6, Ezekiel 20 and verse 6, to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I have had espied for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. So here was how that land of Israel was depicted. But again, to show that this was God doing this, that this was fulfilled when Antiochus III, in that line of Seleucids, Antiochus III invaded Egypt and won control over the ar armies of Ptolemy V, and then at the same time over the land of Israel. It said, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Jews that lived in the land of Israel at that time, actually, history records that they helped Antiochus III defeat the king of the south. So when it says many shall rise up against the king of the south, it wasn't only Antiochus III, but all these others that joined with him. And that's because the Jewish people resented the rule of the Egyptians. And when it says there, neither his chosen people, the south will shall not withstand neither his chosen people. It's speaking of the Jews. It's interesting that they allied themselves, and this is all foretold even before it took place. 
and that he who comes against him would do according to his will with destruction in his power. So these Jews initially welcomed Antiochus III as a liberator from Egypt. And their decision to support Antiochus III proved unwise when he himself turned destruction on the glorious land of, of Israel and its people. We're going to see more of that later. But there's more here that I want us to see. I'd hope to get down to verse 20, but we'll stop there in verse 16 and uh, pick up with this next time because, as I said, every bit of this detail has been fulfilled in history and the unfolding of history. And we see God's purpose and will being accomplished in all that takes place for one purpose, to condemn whom he will, but at the same time preserve a remnant, all of this until Christ should come. And uh, as we know from the vision given to Daniel, Christ is that final kingdom. When he came, that stone made without hands, it came down and destroyed it all. That's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ establishing his kingdom. It's not something we wait for yet, but has been accomplished in his coming and living and dying and rising again and sitting on high, where now he rules and reigns. All right, hymn number 20. Let's turn there and sing this final hymn and then be dismissed. Hymn number 20. our tribute we bring. We lay it before thee, we kneel and adore thee. We bless thy holy name, glad praises we sing. We worship thee, God of our fathers, we bless thee. Storm and tempest, our guide, as thou been. When perils overtake us, escape, thou wilt make us. And with thy help, O Lord, our battles we win. With voices united, our praises we offer to thee. Great Jehovah, glad anthems we raise. Thy strong arm will guide us. God is beside us. To thee, our great Redeemer, forever be praised. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed. Look forward to next time. Oh, Lord.